We Get Outdoors Nation. Today we have the privilege of welcoming a gentleman to the podcast, a guy who excels at going up things. We had Sean Tumor the other week, base jumper who jumps off things. And today we have Mr. Mick Fowler, who's probably been up more things than I've had hot dinners. Um, Mick, welcome to the We Get Outdoors podcast. Thank you very much. <laughs> what an introduction. <laughs> Well, there we go. I just spice it up a little bit. So, <laughs> so I, I've got this huge list in front of me of, of impressive things that you've gone up, whether it's mountains or rock faces, um, sea stacks, sea cliffs, all sorts of things. Um, but I guess what I'd really be interested in to start with is how did you get the bug for going and climbing progressively harder stuff um, up to silly heights? And. <laughs> Well, I suppose it was my father's fault initially. He um, he introduced me to the outdoors. He, he was um, widowed when I was three, and he um, had a, a sort of interest in rock climbing with a couple of friends of his. And he used to drag me uh, as a youngster down to the, the sandstone outcrops to the south of London, which are about 10 metres high. Mm -hmm. And he would do various climbs down there with his friends. And I was dragged along <laughs> and um, it gradually um, came from there, I suppose, really, because he, he eventually introduced me to the Alps. Um, and then I, I badgered him to send me on a rock climbing course. I did a rock climbing course with the Youth Hostels Association and then uh, met people there and met people on the London climbing scene that um, took me to weekend climbing trips, first of all, throughout the UK that led on to um, alpine trips, which led on to trips to Peru, which led on to the Himalaya, which after many years led on to today. <laughs> yeah, and, and here we are. Um, what was it in that sort of teenage years that, um, you know, many teenagers you can have a passion from their parents and then go the opposite way. What was it really that sewed the hook for you to say, I'm going to do this for the next 50 60 however many years into my future <laughs> yeah i think it, it probably did go the other way for a bit because i think he um he took me on a course um with the austrian alpine club when i was 13 and um at, at that stage of course i was still quite a malleable teenager uh, and i went out to the alps with him for two or three summers after that doing the 4,000 metre peaks generally by their easiest routes in the Alps. Mm -hmm. And then when I was, uh, it'll be 20, yeah, in 1976, um, I, after a couple of years of gap where I was more interested in the, the London disco scene and young ladies than climbing, I um, got decided that, I would really like to go to the Alps and climb under my own steam. And so I went out with a group of friends that I'd, I'd made through, through climbing, rock climbing in the UK. And we went out to, to the Alps for two months in 1976 and again in 1977. Um, and yeah, we, I suppose we were lucky enough and fortunate enough to do some, some very good climbs over that period. And that that led ultimately on to climbing the, I suppose, the the routes which I had aspired to climb in the Alps, the, the Walker Spur, the North Face of the Eiger, that kind of thing. And having done those led to me to to look around around the world, really, and ask myself where else I might like to climb and and quite importantly to me to explore. Mm. I, was, I was going to ask that because. Um... Uh, f uh, for me, the sort of sport aspect of being in the outdoors, be it climbing or kayaking or whatever it might be, is sort of secondary to the people I do it with, the places I get to go and the cultures I get to go and go and explore. What, what's your sort of motivation? Is it climbing first or places first or what is it that hooks you? It sounds to me as if we're on much the same wavelength there. <laughs> and I think for me... Um, it's the climb that actually takes me to the place. So I will research hard for um, a, an objective, a climbing objective that inspires me. 
Um, but the perfect objective will be um, in a place that's culturally interesting, um, in a place that I've not been to before, um, and in a place where I'm likely to have a good overall adventure, an overall good trip. It's not purely about the climbing. Mm. It's interesting. I've spent a lot of time in the Himalayas and, um, you know, sitting on a beach with locals actually, or, or sitting anywhere with locals actually, or in a tea house is, is often as enjoyable as anything else that you do within the trip. In fact, sometimes it's even the bit that sticks in your head 15 years later. You can't remember the rest of it, but that one afternoon in a tea house, that sticks. It, it can do. But of course, for me, what I've always done is, is use the mountaineering objective as the reason to go to the place. And so um, increasingly, I've gone to perhaps more remote places, places that are more difficult to get to bureaucratically. Um, and so there's an awfully long build up. So you'll spend perhaps, I don't know, up to a year negotiating permissions and wondering whether you're actually going to be able to get to the objective that you've dreamed about. And so there's a, no doubt about it. The, the key achievement, if you like, of, of any trip that I do is doing the climb that I've set my heart on for the last year or however long it might be. Mm. And everything else comes along with that and is perhaps equally enjoyable at the time. But the real drive to get me there is the, the climbing objective. And how has that planning changed over the years? Because you, you've spent a lot of time, like I have, in the in the Himalaya, be it Pakistan, India, Nepal, Tibet. How's that? How's that changed since you first went there to, through to when you were last there? Oh, I think it's become much much easier because um, you know nowadays um, adventure tourism, as it um, tends to be referred to, has become quite a popular thing. And so, of course, there are agents in the, um, the various countries who, whose job it is basically have set themselves up to help people like me or more normally trekkers and people like that to actually get the various permits and such like that they need. Whereas when I first went, um, I'm into the Himalayas, it was 1984, and we used to, there were no agents as there are today. So we had to do everything ourselves. And that would go even as far as buying the kitchen equipment for our base camp staff um, and obviously negotiating the rates with everybody, um, the rates with the porters, the rates with the liaison officer, the rates with the, with the cook, the kitchen boy. Um, so there was a lot more um, what you might call hands-on organisation that we had to do in those days. Mm. And then... Oh, it must have been when I've been doing it for many years, really. I was always a bit reluctant to use an agent, even when agents were set up, because I thought, well, those agents, they're just taking their cut, really. Mm. But of course, you know, the, the agents also were able to negotiate better rates um, than we were able to negotiate. And so gradually it dawned on me that, in fact, it wasn't really costing very much more to put everything in the hands of an agent. And it certainly took... Um, an awful lot of stress and an awful lot of time consuming um, business away from me if I put it in the hands of an agent. And that, that was particularly important to me because, you know, I had a full time job with the tax office for 39 years. So you know, all of my climbs virtually were done while I was working um, for the tax office in a full time job. And I had a limited amount of time off work. And so any time that could be saved by putting jobs in the hands of somebody else rather than having to deal with these things when I actually arrived in the Himalayan country was time saved that I could put to other, other uses, whether it be family holidays or climbing holidays. So um, to answer your question again, it's changed hugely from us having to do everything ourselves when we first started out to nowadays we tend to put everything, in the, everything within reason in the hands of, a, of an agent to sort out for us. Mm. I I can remember um, I, it was end of August 1998 when I first went to the Himalayas and I, I will never ever forget getting off the plane in Kathmandu I would never forget that experience in those first couple of days how was it for you your first trip to the Himalaya uh, in 84 um, mm. what was that well, like flying I, from the UK <laughs> well the trip I particularly remember actually was two years earlier than that it was my, my first trip outside Europe um, which was to Peru. Ah. And um, 
that was a it, it wasn't a looking back I still remember it as if it was yesterday because I'd never I'd never flown before and I'd never been outside Europe before and I remember we we got on the plane we changed we had the cheapest possible flights we could get and uh, I think we changed planes in in Puerto Rico and I can remember getting out the plane in Puerto Rico and I can remember the overwhelming wave of heat and I was so naive I thought it must be the engine I'd never I'd never been in such a hot climate before <laughs> and it took me some time to realize it was just bloody hot it was nothing to do with the engine <laughs> then we went to on to Caracas I think was our next stop in Venezuela and there it was just about the time of the, the Falklands War and I think Venezuela must have been supporting Argentina and I remember we had an armed guard around the, the plane it was a BOAC a British plane we had an armed guard around the plane and I can remember looking out the window thinking god this is a bit different to going to the Alps <laughs> um, and then then the, the next the plane went on as far as Bogota in Colombia um, and it wouldn't fly to Peru. It was supposed to carry on to Peru, but because of the, you know, the, the Falklands War, um, there was some dispute. It wouldn't fly any further, so we were dumped in Bogota, and then we got an Aero Peru flight uh, to Lima. And I remember there was an emergency landing. There suddenly there was an announcement over the intercom in Spanish, which we didn't understand at all. There was lots of screaming and shouting on board, and the plane just landed. Some I don't know where it was, some remote strip in the middle of a desert somewhere. <laughs> and um, yeah, I can remember they, there was somebody on a step ladder who was up in the engine with a head torch on, trying to sort out some problem in the engine. And they provided us with a bucket, a proper metal bucket full of grappa. And we just sat there with our legs dangling over the side, just drinking grappa. And eventually <laughs> it took off again, landed in Lima, uh, and our trip began. <laughs> And the whole thing from beginning to end for me was just so eye-opening, you know, and I thought this is just brilliant. You know, I want to do more of this from, from all of the, I suppose, exciting and unplanned incidents right through to the climb itself, which we did exactly what we wanted to do. And it, it was a brilliant trip. I remember coming back thinking, yeah, yeah, well, I must do more of this. <laughs> it's funny. I've got so many trips that I could tell you about where the, the traveling to and from the trip is often more dangerous and more adventure, uh, more adventurous than what the actual expedition itself turns out to be. <laughs> oh, I think so. And, it, and it's so true that, you know, once you cross the Bergschund, the kind of challenges that you face are much the same anywhere in the world. But the challenges that you face to actually get to the Bergschund do vary a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jeez, I remember my first trip to the Himalayas. Um, it, it was my first flight as well in 98. I'd never flown before. And um, I took the cheapest flight that was Bangladesh B-Man. And, um, I, I, was, I was with them, yeah. <laughs> we, we took off from Gatwick and the plane shook. And uh, it shook so hard that the light fittings fell out of the ceiling. And one of the male stewards ran down with a, a roll of duct tape and duct taped it back up into the ceiling. And... Um, <laughs> And, and then I couldn't work out. There was a smell of smoke. And we'd had the briefing about no smoking and whatever else. And you, then you look towards the back of the plane and all the stewards and a whole bunch of Bangladeshi guys are there smoking. And um, I think we did about 10 or 12 hours of curry and, um, uh, and Bangladesh TV. That was, um, that, that was my, my first thing. It was quite eye-opening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember my latest, latest uh, Beeman Bangladesh flight where we were going from Dakar to um, Kathmandu. And yeah, it was it was a relatively modern plane and it was counting down the, the minutes to landing. And it said, yeah, 10 minutes to landing, five minutes to landing. And then suddenly it went blank. And then it came, then a new sign came up that said three hours or something like that to landing. But, but there was no announcement. No, there was no, nobody knew what had happened. And it turned out that they decided it was too dangerous to land at Kathmandu. And then turned back to Dakar. Oh shit! And there was no announcement. It just started counting down from three hours or whatever it was down to landing at Dakar. And of course, we got to Dakar, and it was the middle of the night. Everybody had gone home. Nobody knew what to do. Yeah, uh, it was it was great. And, and, uh, I don't know how da I haven't been back through Dakar since '98. I'll be well, '99, I think, the second time way back through. But um. 
it, uh, it, it wasn't exactly the salubrious place you'd want to spend a few days hanging out last time I was there. It was uh, yeah, definitely an interesting place to spend time. Yeah, and it, it definitely was. I think that was 2001 was that when, when I was there. But yes, it was very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it was just cute leave it that. Now, you, you mentioned earlier going on to um, climb the north face of the Eiger, which in in my mind is one of the most iconic faces in in the european alps um it, it's the one certainly i was brought up reading about you know first ascent of the eiger so on and so forth um how, how was how did you manage yourself to go and take on such an iconic climb and well of course i, I had read the white spider heinrich harrow's book and i was very very aware of the history of the eiger mm. but it was 1980 when i climbed it and i think we'd been climbing routes of that standard in the alps for the previous four years since 1976 and gradually ticking off the the sort of the great north faces if you like of the alps and um, and so i think technically i was confident that we will be able to do it um, but even so it's still an intimidating face and I remember the first time that we tried it in must have been 1979 I think and the mist was down and there's a waterfall pouring down the lower part of the face <laughs> and we started up and we we just didn't feel it felt very intimidating and we retreated and then returned the following year um, I mean, perhaps become a bit more experienced, put up our, our confidence a bit more. Um, and then I think it was more, from my point of view, a really interesting experience to, to climb up through all of these named places. You know, the Swallow's Nest Bivouac, the Hinterstoitz of Travis, the Ice Hose, Death Bivouac, you know, the Travis of the Gods, the Exit Cracks, and sort of gradually tick them off in my mind as we went up. And, um, you know, it, it wasn't by you know, standards we were climbing in England, an incredibly difficult climb, mm. but it was one that was so steeped in history that, um, you know, it was an, an, an immensely rewarding and memorable climb. I, I often find that w when you do something for the first time, you have little frame of reference and other than research that you can do using Google and talking to people who've been in the area and whatever else, but you have little frame of reference about what you're really going to expect. And, and I actually personally find that easier than going and tackling something that somebody's done before for the first time. And has like, people have a habit in the outdoors of giving things horrendous names like death bivouac, or um, <laughs> there's, there's, there's a rapid uh, that I've paddled called euthanasia. Um, I paddled in my kayak. Um, and there's another, okay. Yeah, on, on, the, on the Zambezi, which is about 10 hours from where I am now, 10 hours drive, there's another rapid called, I've kayaked it, it's called uh, commercial suicide. And um, I, personally, I'd rather not have the rapids or the, or the faces or the bivouacs or the camps given any names at all. I'd just like to go and do it and treat it from scratch. Um, and take what's in front of you as neutral. I think that, that personally, that for me, that works really well. Yeah, I think certainly on something like the Eiger, it, it adds to the whole um, intimidating atmosphere of the face. Um, because, because, of course, you know, Death Bivouac was named after the two people who died there, <laughs> Sigelmeer and Meiringer. Um, and almost inevitably, you do read up on the history of a climb like that and are very aware of all of the epics that have taken place on the Eiger as you climb it. Whereas climbing in the Himalaya um, you know, on an unclimbed route, yeah, you're, it's just you and there's the mountain and you get on with it. And there's none of that sort of intimidating history. That's it. That's it. Speaking of there being no history, we had a, um, a recent the other week uh, or the day with the, the Nepalese guys um, First, uh, first, is it first winter ascent of K2? Um, it's a mm. pretty huge achievement. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and an amazing effort by a, a, the, the Nepalese team just showing what um, Nepalese mountaineers are capable of and, and operating in those temperatures. Oh, it's, I'm afraid the Himalayas, 
Well, even 8,000 metre peaks are not for me. 8,000 metre peaks in winter. Definitely count me out. No. <laughs> yeah. Because I was. Cause it's not my kind of climbing, but a wonderful achievement. Yeah. Absolutely incredible. And I, the, the temperatures are what struck me because, you know, normally if you climb one of those 8,000 peaks, peaks, it's sort of um, April, May type time seems to be the time where people most often go. Um, yeah. And at 8,000 metres then, it can be damn cold. I just can't imagine how cold it was for them in January. I mean, that is just ridiculous. No, I, I can't. Um, and uh, Oh, God, no, I, I would just not want to operate at that altitude, especially in winter. No, no thanks. Count me out. I, I, I like sub-7,000 metre peaks, with reasonable temperatures, but just with... Um, unclimbed spectacular lines and places where there's not very many people <laughs> preferably no people preferably no people i <laughs> wouldn't agree well they're, they're the very best trips to me are those areas that i've been to and we've been to we've been very fortunate over the years to places where perhaps no westerners have ever been before in some areas you know, and, and um obviously that introduces a whole new um area of uncertainty because you don't even know whether or not the objective that you've set your heart on is actually going to be any good you might even get there and find that you just think it's a rubbish objective or it's too dangerous and um, but if it does turn out to be good um then i don't know it's, it's a an added pleasure really to go to a place where there is nobody there it's uh, so it's incredible because as the all the different conflicts around that sort of uh, India, Tibet, China, Pakistan, Afghanistan even, as those conflicts, they all seem to move around a bit. And a an area where there's been a massive conflict for maybe 10 or 20 or more years, when that suddenly becomes open, often you find that mountaineers are the first people to go into that area to go and start or bagging the unclimbed peaks that previously would have been uh, inaccessible. So it's quite easy to go and bump into Pakistani people who've never seen a, a, a white European person before. Um, oh my, yes, yeah. And, you know, and still like that, of course, that things are still changing. Um, and, you know, at the moment, you know, the area that I'd most love to go to would be East Tibet. Um, but the last time I managed to get there was 2007. And, and I think that was the last time there was a mountaineering trip to East Tibet. So, yeah, they, I'm sure the, the locals in East Tibet, most of them, would not have seen a, a European mountaineer. And the, there's many, many valleys there that have not been visited by, by Westerners at all. So there's, when the, the, um, the bureaucratic challenges change, yeah, you're right, new opportunities open up for, for mountaineers, certainly. They do. They do. I um, I kayaked on the White Nile in Uganda and towards Sudan in um, uh, about 2000, to about 2000, I think it was. And it hadn't been kayaked very much. But um, I, I have to admit to being shot at by the El Lord's Resistance Army um, uh, at, at one particular time because there was a group of soldiers who still hadn't been informed that the civil war was over. <laughs> <laughs> so, they missed i hope <laughs> yeah, they, they they did we were in a, a white minivan taxi and uh, there was a um a, a extra hole in the undercarriage or through the white side of it beneath where our feet were by the time we got through to kampala um <laughs> it, it didn't make contact with flesh for anybody so i guess that no. <laughs> all makes it more memorable that's it that's it that's, it's another one i can't tell you about three quarters of the rapids i kayaked but i can tell you about ak-47 rounds whistling around a moving vehicle <laughs> um how, how do you go about choosing these places to go to the peaks to climb the faces to climb the routes um especially i mean today we've got google earth and um, all that stuff that we can play with but heading back into your early career um how did you choose those places Mm. And it was really just by a huge amount of research and um, by whenever I saw a photograph of a mountain that I thought was potentially interesting, then I would I would always follow it up. So I would find out who the photographer was. Um, I would contact the photographer 
ask them if they had any other photographs um, and build up a, a picture of what that mountain was like and find out exactly where it was and obviously research the, um, that particular area, whether it was find out if it was a culturally interesting area and decide if it was the sort of place that I'd like to go to. And I gradually built up a box file of potentially interesting objectives. And uh, you know, it's amazing how helpful people can be if you, if you contact them and ask them for help. Um, so really, what's, that, that was how I built a, a list of objectives originally. Mm. Um, and of course, Google Earth really um, allows you to, to fly around and check out those objectives more thoroughly. Um, for better or for worse, I have to admit. Um, yeah, it's just, there's, there's a little it, bit of almost knowing too much or thinking you know too much in terms of like reducing the level of exploration. Um, it takes the element of surprise away. And it also means that um, yeah, it used to be the case that you had to put a tremendous amount of effort in. And there are a lot of... Um, effectively blanks on the map. You could look on the map and see that there were mountains there, but you had no idea whether how spectacular they might be without actually researching that particular area. And now, of course, you can get onto Google Earth and you can fly around and, and get a very good idea of what it's like. Mm. And, and it does, I, you know, in a way, um, I think it's a little bit sad. It, it, um, it takes away a little bit of the uncertainty and therefore a little bit of the sense of adventure. But on the other hand, of course, it is, it makes life much easier. Like so many things in this world. Well, <laughs> yeah, I was it's a say, bit disappointing if, perhaps, but we embrace it anyway. <laughs> that's it. I mean, if, if you've got a, a full-time job with the tax office, um, getting the bang for your buck from your annual leave to go and actually go somewhere and not risk wasting that time, I suppose that that means you can actually go somewhere and go climbing and, and actually get some stuff done as opposed to getting there and finding out it's not as good as you were hoping it was going to be. Well, that's true. But on the other hand, um, if everybody has easy access to the same research material, you might well go there and find that somebody else has gone there with the same idea. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, that's really, well, not, not what I would want because I, I like to go to places where, there are no other people. Mm. <laughs> keep, keep away from other people, really. And just enjoy the mountains. It's incredible. And um, what was the, what's been the most sort of speculative trip you've had where you've not had all the data and you, you're kind of going thinking that it'll be great, but actually it's quite speculative? Oh, I think that the one with the, that we were most uncertain about was a trip that I did with Paul Ramsden in 2015, it would be, to a mountain called Gav Ding in the west of Nepal. And um, I was aware of the existence of Gav Ding. Um, and then I saw a very distant photograph of the area. And I knew it was an area that I wanted to go to because mm. it, I'd not been to the far west of Nepal before. I knew it was very ethnically interesting. And I knew that not very many people went there. Um, and I saw this photograph taken from a long, long way away. And there was one mountain that just looked as if it might be a bit better than the others around there. Um, and I showed it to this photograph to Julian Freeman Atwood, who's a friend of mine who had explored that part of the world. And he said, oh, I think that's Gav Ding. And so we explored on Google Earth. And on Google Earth now, you can set the time of day. Um, and by setting the time of day, you can... Um, of course, find out really how high and steep the faces are. And so by, by setting it to, to midday, you could see that this north face of Gav Ding had a, a bigger shadow than any of the other faces around. So we thought, hmm, it, has, it, it is quite a big face. We researched a bit more. Julian had actually been up to a base camp site there, but he hadn't been up to the valley directly below the face. So there were no photographs of the face itself. But we knew it was an unclimbed mountain. We knew it had a long shadow on Google Earth. We knew from this very, very distant photograph that it had an interesting outline. Um, and we, we knew it was a, an area that we both very much wanted to go to. Mm. And so we organised the trip to get there. 
which was quite tricky for permits wise and various other ways. Um, and to actually arrive in the valley, which had been not visited by Western mountaineers before. So I mean, we had, as I say, no photographs of it. And to actually arrive there and see that um, it was a fantastic objective and it fitted all of our criteria um, was a, a pretty special moment, I must admit. And uh, I think it was one of my very best trips um, that we, we achieved what we set out to achieve and it turned out to be a, a wonderful objective. And we could never have known it could have been just rubbish. We could have got there and said, oh God, it's just too dangerous or so we're not gonna go for it. So I, I always look back on that trip as a, as a very, very special one. How did you manage um, working out what kit your gear you need to take with you um, based on the fact that you don't actually know what it is you need to go and do when you get there? Um, Oh, that, that's not too bad because um, obviously we, we've got a good idea um, that you know, it's six and a half thousand metre peak. Um, it's going to be, and, and we would always, I, I prefer mixed routes. And so yeah. we'd always be taking high screws and some rock pegs and a selection of nuts. I mean, you'd have a look at the face from below and your only decision re really is perhaps how many ice screws you might take because you're always going to keep your gear down to a realistic minimum mm. because it's knackering to, to do difficult climbing with a big rucksack on. Mm. So um, we take enough gear to, to tackle all sorts of different terrain and make a final decision about what exactly we're going to carry on the route once we've actually seen, seen it. What's your preference on a route? Because as, as my time in mountaineering has been around, um, we, we've almost gone from a space where we're carting huge amounts of kit up and we're, we're having many nights on a face all the way through to sort of some of the, I've read a book about extreme alpinism or something the other, other year that was going, going light, going hard, going fast and doing in six days what previously you'd have done in, sorry, doing in one day what previously you'd have done in six um mm. what's your take on that and how's it how's that changed for you over the years of going up these faces and um, uh, well it's not changed for me personally at all um, <laughs> and that's you know the, the way that i um, enjoy my climbing is to and um, to not go as fast as i possibly can um and I'm, I'm very happy to spend several nights on the face um climb during the hours of daylight um, and soak in my surroundings um, and then you know carry enough equipment and enough food to enable me to have a, a, a warm if not comfortable bivouac mm. um, and I've always done that so I, I've really have no enthusiasm whatsoever for climbing 40 50 hours non-stop um, and then arriving back down at base camp with not very many photographs because half the time it's been dark or you've been trying to go so fast <laughs> that you haven't had enough time to stop and take photographs. Whereas I, I tend to be a, a pretty slow and relaxed mountaineer and, uh, and I'm certainly not going to become a fast one now. So I, I've always stuck with that way of doing my mountaineering right from when I first started out. Mm. And um I'm just bouncing around all sorts of things that come into my head. Mm. Uh, I, I listened to an interview with Alex Honnold um, the other day, and he was declaring the fact that he didn't really ever feel fear. And uh, how have you managed yourself doing things that are obviously got a high, quite a high level of risk um, and in very remote locations where if you screw it up, help is a really long way away. How do you manage your own headspace when you're doing it? Do you sing to yourself? Do you not get scared? What's the what's the thing? Um, no, well, I think, you know, you say there's a high level of risk. I mean, obviously, you, you look at the objective that you're intending to climb and decide whether or not it is risky and whether or not um, you're prepared to accept the level of risk, which is inevitably going to be there. I mean, you know, mountaineering, rock climbing even, is risky to a certain extent. Mm. Um, what I do is always try and choose an objective which is um, at least objectively safe, that um, is not prone to avalanches, is not prone to rockfall, and 
by carrying enough kit, um, I am able to um, spend several nights in the same place, in a safe place, if need be, if the weather does get very bad. Um, and so I would say there's no... <laughs> To say there's no fear sounds a bit silly, but I mean, there's, um, you're frightened if something goes badly wrong. And so if you see that um, a Serac above you has broken and is coming down towards you, obviously I would be frightened. Yeah. Um, but by being, by going relatively slowly and taking enough kit to look after yourself and not having any accidents, then... I think we've reduced the level of risk to a, a level that we're we're comfortable with, um, and so no, I don't get particularly frightened. Um, we're not going there to get frightened. We're going there to have a good time, to enjoy our holiday. Our holiday. That's uh, yeah, it's it's very interesting. I find that when I'm doing stuff that is taking me to the threshold, to the edge of my threshold. Uh, which doesn't happen very often these days. I've broken too many bones, to be honest with you, to be going to the edge of my threshold too often. Um, I, I end up humming kids' nursery rhymes for some reason that I can't explain to you. Um, and, and it's not in the presence of other people. It's when you're quite distant from somebody else. You know, you're, you're, you're leading in your X amount of meters above somebody. And I don't know why it is, but it just allows me to focus in my head a little bit and maybe dispel other thoughts about other things um, that would get in the way of me focusing on the objective. I can't tell you why it is, but it just seems to work for me in a weird way. Yeah. Perhaps I've just got a, a vacant head. I've got nothing in my head. I doubt <laughs> and, that uh, very much. I just fill it with the view um, <laughs> and uh, the scenery around me and what's going on. So, but I know I've never done that. I've never, never really sung nursery rhymes or, <laughs> or, done anything odd like that <laughs> i was just i was just wondering if, if some people have weird stuff like me so i thought maybe you did but you never know um yeah no sorry to disappoint but no, it's fine it's all good <laughs> not on that front it's all good um so you've mentioned several times the, the word holiday job tax office uh, how did you manage to hold down a full-time job and you said you had a family before we press record and then go mountaineering um, and when I look through some of the bio that I've been sent, it strikes me that pretty close to every other year, you've ended up on a large peak somewhere in the world, quite often every year. How have you balanced all that lot together? Yes, it was um, it was every other year when the children were young. And then um, I decided I, I really did need my annual fix of mountaineering. So it became every year. <laughs> um, but, but you're right, the the balancing between job, family, and mountaineering uh, has been very challenging. I, I can't deny that. Um, and I was lucky to have a, a pretty understanding employer in the tax office that if I organise something well enough in advance, say I, I would generally book my holiday about a year in advance, um, and you know, my superiors were more interested in where, where I was going and what I was doing, because it wasn't very usual for people to book their holidays so far in advance. And it was quite difficult for them to say no when it was a whole year in advance, especially <laughs> when I would say, well, this is a, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Another which one. Which they gradually got wind of the fact this seemed to happen every year. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I did make a very, at work, I made a very special effort to make sure that my superiors were never inconvenienced by the fact that I was away for a long period of time. Um, and they were also very understanding in that I was able to um, extend my, my annual leave entitlement was about six weeks. And by working extra hours, um, I, I was able to extend that perhaps to about eight weeks per year, which was split them about three to four weeks for um, mountaineering and three to four weeks for the family, which, um, well, it was, it was a balance of some kind. I can't say it was perfect, but with a lot of juggling, it, it did work. So I was able to have a summer holiday with the family, a winter holiday with the family and still get my mountaineering done. Mm. Um, what did suffer in all of the, um, the juggling was my 
at the, my standard of climbing because prior to the family, I would be rock climbing or winter climbing every weekend in the UK. Um, after the family came, something had to give and it was the weekend climbing that gave. So the, the technical standard of my climbing ha has gradually been in decline for, um, for 29 years now, <laughs> since, <laughs> since, my, since my daughter appeared on the scene. <laughs> um, but that's absolutely fine. I, I have no problems with that. Um, but it's, it can't be denied that that has been very difficult but it's really the, the reason as well that I stayed with the tax office was that um, they were um, a commendably flexible employer in that way. Mm. It's, it's interesting as I talk to all of our listeners all over the world um, that when you talk to them often about their biggest barrier to getting in the outdoors, it is this juggling act to, I mean, to get in the outdoors more. It's the, um, uh, it's the I've got a wife, I've got a family, I've got a job, and and I've got a passion that I want to pursue. And it's often the biggest struggle that people have. And I, I'm a firm personal believer that planning, planning is part of the secret sauce for getting the balance right. Because you you can't just well certainly my wife's very understanding. But uh, if if I tell her I'm going to disappear for a month at two days notice or two weeks notice, she gets quite uh, yeah she's not very understanding about it so i really think the planning is part of that secret source to getting as much time in the outdoors as possible i think you're absolutely right yeah planning letting people know well in advance and also um making sure that that you come back happy regardless of whether it's been a rubbish trip or not um, so I've always said, you know, a, a happy father is a father who's been mountaineering. Whether he's been successful or not is by the by. He has to make a special effort to be very happy indeed when he gets back <laughs> and, and not grumble about the fact that the weather was rubbish and he didn't get up anything and had a miserable time. <laughs> I've learned my lessons on that over the years too. I, uh, on the way back from a trip three years ago, I, uh, I took an extra day in Dubai on the way back to Johannesburg um, just so I could sleep for a day because I knew damn well when I got home, the first thing that I was going to be expected to do was go back into hardcore daddying and let my wife have some downtime. And uh, I'd, I'd been up in Alaska and I was ex exhausted in every possible way and jet lagged as well. And I thought I just need that extra day to press reset before I get back home. <laughs> But you didn't admit that you'd been in Dubai for a day. <laughs> I, I did because the upside was that I got all of my laundry done in Dubai whilst I was there. So I came home with a suitcase or bags rather full of completely clean clothes. And uh, as opposed to me going and doing what I usually do, which is get home and dump them all in the, on the scullery floor and spend three days trying to go back to work and deal with smelly stuff. Um, yeah, and you smelt nice and clean as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> perfect <laughs> that's it although I, I you a funny story about smelling nice and clean um, or the opposite of it i almost missed a flight from an expedition um in in northern india uh, a kayaking expedition in the winter um in about 2002 I think it was 2002. Anyway, um, I ended up getting in the bus to go to the airport in my dry suit with expedition thermals underneath. And then I actually got on the plane with the same dry suit and smelly thermals on. And my, my kayaking helmet on my head. Because um, if I got changed, I just would have missed the flight. <laughs> So the dry suit keeps the smell in. <laughs> it was fun, funnily enough, I had a whole three seats to myself to lie down. I can't can't imagine why somebody wouldn't want to sit by me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so throughout this time, um, you've been working in partnership with Berghaus, um, certainly for the past was it twelve years or so? Um, More than that now, since two thousand and eight. Yes, yeah. No, I've been at, yeah, 2008. So, um, yeah, I'm an ambassador with Burkhouse, so I'm testing their equipment, giving feedback on their kit, and uh, and generally working with them as much as I can to, to help them to produce good kit. 
So they do prototypes for me, which I tested in the UK and perhaps in the Alps, and then actually use them in the Himalaya. And um, it's been a good, it's been a good working relationship, and that's been been with us for what twelve years now. Yeah, that's awesome. Now, um, one of the questions, um, and I was a sponsored kayaker for many years before I stopped doing quite as much kayaking as I, as I used to. One of the questions that we face from a lot of our younger audience the whole time is, how do I get sponsored? As though it's the holy grail of um, of getting in the outdoors. Um, if is sponsorship as good as it sounds? Is it really free gear? Um, and if people are hell bent on getting sponsored, what advice do you have for them? And um, I, I think you've got to think twice about whether or not you're going to make it into your career. Um, because if you're going to make it into your career, then, of course, you are beholden to your sponsors to a large extent. That's where your, um, your money is going to come from. And inevitably, um, you have to, to a certain extent, jump to what exactly they want to do. Um, I've been very, very fortunate because um, yeah, the, the, the ambassadorship or the sponsorship side for me has, has always been uh, secondary to my employment by the tax office. And so um, Berghouse have been a wonderful supporter because they allow me to do exactly what I want to do. Um, and they support that. So I make all of the, the decisions about the climbs that I want to do. And yes, we work together as to how Burkhouse can get the best out of that. But, the, but I am doing the sort of climbs that I want to do. And that's the most important thing to me. The difficulty for people starting out, I think, is, is that when you start out, you haven't built up um, a, a, a full history of climbs. And, and so um, you are more beholden to your sponsor. And I think that can be quite tricky. Um, now, whether or not it's a, a good life or a bad life, um, I think that depends a bit on, on your own personal circumstances. Mm. Um, I mean, I personally, I like to be at home quite a lot. I like to have been at home to see the, the family grow up, to see the children grow up. Um, and I wouldn't want to be away an awful lot, like I know a lot of sponsored mountaineers are. Um, so, you know, some sponsored mountaineers are actually employees of the companies that they're sponsored by. Mm. And that means, of course, that um, they, they have to, to go away and be away on mountaineering objectives, um, regardless of what's going on at home. And I suppose what I'm saying is, like almost everything in life, it's a balancing act. There's... For most people, there's good things about sponsorship and there's bad things about sponsorship. I'm in the lucky situation with Berghaus that I think we have a, a good working relationship, but um, I, I'm climbing the kind of routes that I've always wanted to climb. Mm. And they are the sort of things that they would like me to do to build up support for the Berghaus equipment, test Berghaus equipment, show it being used in extreme circumstances. And so for us, it works very, very well. Yeah, I, I always tell people don't rush to get sponsored because there's no such thing as free gear. Um, it, it, it'll cost you something somewhere. Um, it, it just because just you haven't swiped your credit card to get that down jacket or whatever it might be, you're, you're going to pay you're going to pay that sponsor back somehow because they want a lot more from you than the few hundred pounds for a, or a few hundred dollars for the down jacket. They want a lot more from you than that. Well, it's a two sided arrangement. Uh, of course it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So um, now, while we're on the topic of Berghaus, uh, what's what's the one bit of Berghaus kit you just never leave home without? Oh, <laughs> there's quite a few. Um, Go on, I'll give you three. One, one that I've always used, which, uh, and it surprises me that uh, more people don't use, is their um, super gators the Yeti super gators, you know, they go right over the boot and come up to just below the knee. I mean, they're just so good for keeping um, any, well, basically keeping snow, um, damp, everything out from your, your boots and keeping you nice and, nice and dry and warm, you know, particularly if you're walking about and, 
approaching climbs in Scotland, walking through boggy terrain where inevitably the water's going to come up over your ankles every now and then. And I mean, the super gators are just so good in that respect. And I think that's one. That's one. The other one would be the, their down jackets. They do a ramchi down jacket, which is something I did work with them on. So I would say it's good, wouldn't I? And there, um, it's a sort of top quality down jacket. And I must admit now, I tend to wear them in the UK as well as in the Himalaya. And they, they really have kept me warm and cosy. I never used to carry a down jacket with me. I perhaps I did in the Himalaya, but not in the Alps. And now I will always carry one of these jackets. And I was in the Alps last summer and we bivouacked on top of the Weisshorn, which is mm. just about four and a half thousand meters with, with no other protection really other than the down jacket. And um, worth their weight in gold. They're yeah, really light, really warm. So th there'd be my two off the top of my head, favorite bits of kit, yeah. Yeah, I think when I re remember first starting out in the outdoors, um, down was a really, um, uh, what's the right word of saying? It was a really, uh, either people loved it or hated it. So you got the camp who said, when when, when you're down, when, when the down gets wet, it's next to useless. Right. Um, and, and then you ended up with, with the other camp who said, down is the best thing ever and it's light and it's convenient and, um, how people are producing down jackets and down sleeping bags now is with the level of waterproofness they're getting, they're sort of mitigating out the, if it gets too wet factor. Um, it's an incredible thing. Well, that's right. It has made a big difference. And it was interesting that I had very much firsthand experience of that because when we were um, coming up with this Ramchi down jacket for Burkhouse, they gave me a prototype to use and I got in a tangle on a bivouac and snow got in my sleeping bag and my sleeping bag got wet and my down jacket got wet. And the next day in you know, my sleeping bag had big balls of ice in it yeah. and my down jacket was dried out. And I just couldn't understand what had happened because although they'd made the jacket to the spec that I wanted, they hadn't told me that they were actually using hydrophobic down. And it was just a wonderful demonstration in front of me that it really does work. And you don't have to be quite as careful nowadays to keep your down kit dry as used to be the case. So yeah, it's made a huge difference. So hydrophobic down, is that where they um, treat the feathers before they use them or something or what's- Yes, yeah, yeah treat them with um, water repellent chemicals. And so the, the down does not absorb the, um, the water in the same way as it does if it's not treated. Okay. so. Um, in thinking about your, your history in mountaineering, and you, you mentioned sort of 74 and 76 at one point in time, and here we are in 2021. What have been the, <laughs> and other than down, what's been the, the best, best gear and um, adventure sports clothing improvements that you've seen um, and experienced throughout that journey that you've been on? Oh, I, I, do. I think um, there's so much more um, efficient, lightweight kit on the market nowadays. And I suppose um, one piece of kit that I'd really point towards uh, being improvements on is a stove in that we, we, we use um, propane, butane gas cylinders. And back in the day, we used to allow one gas cylinder per day. And of course, each gas cylinder is 250 grams. It's relatively speaking heavy. Mm. So you're going for a route that you think is going to last, say, seven or eight days. You'll be taking seven or eight gas cylinders. Now we have we work on the basis that one gas cylinder should last three days. The stoves are that much more efficient. Um, so now for a really big route, we'd take perhaps three gas cylinders to be on the safe side, whereas we would have taken in the olden days perhaps eight. And that's a massive difference <laughs> in weight. It really is saved 1.25 kilos haven't you i mean that's incredible um, yeah which, which is a lot it's a big percentage of what you've got on your back mm. and, and the other one that's um has made a difference is um i on ice screws um you know with when i first started you know we we weren't really using screw in ice screws we tend to have hammer in ice screws and warthogs each one was was heavy then we moved to stainless steel ice screws, which were great, but pretty heavy. And now um, 
we've got I mean I'm um, sponsored by Black Diamond as well and they have very lightweight ice screws I don't know what they're made of but they are so much lighter than the stainless steel ones and again yeah ice screws are pretty heavy and if you're carrying six ice screws on a big route to have six really light ice screws compared to six pretty heavy ones is a pretty significant saving in weight mm. and I think we've seen that sort of saving across across the board and um, so the weight on our backs now must be significantly lighter let's say than what it was you know back in the 70s yeah yeah i mean everything has got um interestingly um when i first started playing in the outdoors if you had light weight it was almost ending up being semi-disposable after a a big trip um, or even halfway through the trip whereas you know, a, a Hilleberg tent, for instance, I think I've had mine for eight seasons now and it's still going strong. And it's been out in some obscene weather, especially in Alaska and up north in uh, Norway and Sweden in the winter. Um, it's been an obscene and it's still going. Um, I don't think I'd have got the same out of a lightweight tent 30 years ago. Um, I think it would have been a very different experience. Mm. So you've mentioned the family and mentioned being at home lots. And you also mentioned that you followed in your dad's footsteps. Um, are any of your kids following in yours? Um, uh, not really, no. I mean, <laughs> I, I've had, my, my daughter's what, 29 and my son's 26. And my, my daughter, they, they both love the outdoors and love spending time in the outdoors. But they're not really showing any great interest in... Um, in showing a passion for for climbing in the same way as as I have over the years, um, and you know that's that doesn't upset me not at all. Um, I, I am very pleased that they both enjoy the outdoors. I, I you know I, I like that. Um, I don't think I would want them to follow in my footsteps of doing Himalayan climbs. I think that must be quite worrying for a parent. <laughs> Um, so I, I'm happy that they just enjoy a time in the outdoors and, and find their own ways in life rather than, if you like, copying what their father had done, has done. <laughs> You're so right. I've had my mother not speak to me for um, uh, for several several periods, several extended periods as in my late teens, I bound home having kayaked over Swallow Falls in North Wales, which you probably know <laughs> where Swallow Falls is. And... Um, and proudly show my mum the VHS recording of it. And then she says she didn't raise me to try and commit suicide and this, that, and the other. And uh, now being a parent, I think that I can start to understand what it is that she was feeling as I watched my own daughter grow up. Yeah, You're not encouraging your children to kayak over the swallow falls. <laughs> No, well, it, no. Although, interestingly, my little girl, she's uh, going to be five this year and I think she's far more adventurous age five than I ever was. Um, the, the stuff that she climbs up and falls out of. And um, I mean, if, if we were living in the UK now, I probably would have had several visits, visits from social services because she's only four, <laughs> four and a half and she's broken three bones um, by pushing her limits. So um yeah, I've. We, in fact, one. If just to share a funny story, is she climbed up the uh, the the pine bookshelf in her bedroom that's about six and a half, seven foot tall, because she wanted to get a um, a teddy off the top, and she climbed up the top, sat on the top, couldn't work out how to get off, so she jumped, and uh, that was a broken ankle and a hospital visit. So um, maybe I've got it coming for me. Maybe I've got like come up, come up or something. I was going to say, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I should be kayaking in the Himalaya. That's it. That's it. She'll she'll be off. Who knows? It's it's all good. So um, uh, people really should go and check out you and what you've done throughout your life, Mick, because it is truly incredible. Some of the climbs and peaks. What's um, other than the one you mentioned in 2015 um, and the Eiger, and you've mentioned a few, but but what's the remaining? peak or ice climb or crag that you've climbed that's the one that sticks in the back of your head the entire time oh 
that's a really difficult one to answer because you know there's not just the Himalayan climbs. There's a, a lot of the climbs that I've done, um, rock climbs stick in my mind very much as well. I mean, you probably know we um, we had a um, a period when we were very into cl- trying to climb unclimbed sea stacks around the coast of the UK, mm. um, and we had a little boat, a deflowerer as we christened her, to take us out to these sea stacks. And um, a lot of those trips stay very, very much in my mind um, in that they were such such great days out that had all the ingredients of like a good time, I suppose you'd say. Similar to the Himalayan routes, you know, you'd go out there, you'd um, uh, being a non-nautical person, quite often the, the sea approach was very challenging indeed and trying to get out the boat onto the sea stack and then climb up, um, you know, quite difficult climbing up sea stacks to, to unclimb summits and then abseil back down into the boat. A lot of those were very, very memorable. Um, I can think of a thing called Clet Rock off the north coast of Scotland it was um, particularly exciting. Another one called The Needle off the Isle of Hoy on the same island as the Old Man of Hoy. Yep. But um, a rather more... And challenging objective than the old man of Hoy, where we tied two ropes together, abseiled into the sea, and then swam out to the sea stack, um, and then managed to climb the stack, which I found very difficult. And then abseiled back down, and then had to swim off to the to the south to to climb the cliffs to get back up to the top. So there's lots of things like that that are, are wonderful memories. And the Himalayan climbs all the greater range climbs. Yeah, every one of them really in, um, has been very special. And I suppose, yeah, I mentioned Gav Ding earlier. That was, that was great. And my first success in the Himalaya, a mountain called Spantic in Pakistan, that's one that will um, stay very much in my mind because that's our, our first success in the Himalaya. Our very first trip to the Himalaya had been... Um, not a disaster, but I mean, we'd not actually done any climbing at all. We spent six weeks there and we didn't even tie onto the rope. Um, oh, Jesus. <laughs> and I was, I was pretty obsessed with climbing in those days, I have to admit. And so to spend six weeks and not even tie onto the rope on my climbing holiday was a bit of a disaster for me. And then to actually be successful with Victor Saunders on this, this mountain spantic on the, the Golden Pillar of Spantic back in 1987. Um, that, that, was, that was very special indeed, yeah. Because I can't imagine six weeks <sighs> surrounded by mountains, looking at them and not tying into a rope. Oh, my word. No, nope. no, nope, we never actually tied on. <laughs> I just, <laughs> sorry, that would actually make me speechless, which is a very rare occurrence. Um, <laughs> I yeah I can't imagine now uh, there's there's two particular climbs that I want to talk to you about um, one probably won't be a surprise to you but for other people who don't know you did climb a, a 20 meter ice climb um, out of a leaking toilet outflow at St Pancreas Station <laughs> we did <laughs> and a very fine climb it was too <laughs> So for those who don't know, St Pancreas Station, this is the station in the centre of London, um, uh, in the UK. How on earth did you find an ice route to climb in the centre of London? Well, I, I was working in the central London at the time, um, in the, the head office of the tax office. And, and I would drive in occasionally. And as I, I would drive past St Pancreas Station, so I could see each day that this this ice fall was beginning to develop down the side of St Pancras Station. And, you know, eventually it got to the stage where I thought it, it would be rude not, not, to, not to climb this because it was your perfect building ice fall in that um, there were three parallel drain pipes down the side of the station and the ice was completely encasing two of them. But the third one was free from ice. And so you could climb the ice and thread slings behind the drain pipe supports on the third ice, uh, the third drain pipe to protect it. And so, so I can tell you that each drain pipe section was eight feet long and there were eight of them. So it was a 64 foot ice climb <laughs> up the side of the station. And um, 
Yeah, no, it was a good, memorable evening because, uh, well, How was the well crowd? firstly, you must have had a crowd about you. Well, it was dark. It was dark. But yeah, there was a bit of a crowd started to develop. Um, and I climbed up. And of course, at the top, it was a bit nasty because it was a leaking toilet outflow. <laughs> but um, <laughs> a sling around the drain pipe at the top and lowered back down. And then the, uh, the police arrived. And it seemed that the St Pancras station management and were concerned and didn't want us climbing this ice fall. So they'd ask the, the police to stop us. They hadn't come out themselves and asked us to stop. And anyway, these two policemen arrived and they were great. And they said, well, they, the St Pancras station management have asked you to stop doing this. And we said, well, we've just done it. And they, they were two young blokes and they looked up and of course the rope went up through this sling at the top and I just lowered back down. Anyway, there was a bit of chat and they said, well, look, look, just finish what you're doing quickly and then clear off. And he said, but we're really interested to see how you do this because he'd never done ice climbing before. So they went and sat in their car and they must have been, I think, I don't know which police force they were from, but they were in a plain car. So they just went and sat in their car. And then after a bit, I think it was Chris Watts, who I was with, he top roped up to the top, came down. And Mike Morrison, who was a third chap there who'd come down from Manchester for the evening specially, was just waiting his turn and another set of police arrived and I think I think this lot were British Rail Police and they were really aggressive and rude and I can remember the first set of policemen just sort of disappeared and this lot got really shirty about it and poor old Mike Morrison who'd come all the way down from Manchester to climb this this feature that never actually managed to do it and uh, Anyway, I think they threatened to prosecute us for behaviour likely to cause a breach of the peace or something, but no, nothing ever happened. And they obviously told the fire brigade about it. And overnight, the fire brigade removed it. And they removed the whole icicle from the side of St Pancras Station. And it was, it was actually on the cover of the Daily Telegraph, Daily Telegraph the next day. <laughs> it said... Was it firemen using their axes to remove an icicle from the side of St Pancras Station? <laughs> and it turned out that St Pancras Station's management, only their only concern was that we might damage the listed building of St Pancras Station. But of course, the fire brigade, when they removed the, the ice, just chipped all the brickwork. You can still see it today where they chipped the brickwork at the side of the drain pipe. <laughs> Whereas we just climbed up the ice and didn't damage the building at all. <laughs> yeah. So I, want to go, I want to go back there and put a plaque something along the lines Mick Fowler climbed here or something like that yeah. and that would be the that would be priceless <laughs> the sad thing is of course that the you know St Pancras station has all been refurbished the drain pipe doesn't leak anymore ah, you know. ruined all the fun ruined all the fun now um, you've spent a lot of time by the looks of your climbs in Scotland in particular in and around the west coast of Scotland and it's a uh, it's an area that I know very, 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 very well. Um, and I'm just wondering, as I look through this list, you've got Apple Cross and Sky mentioned, Cape Wrath. Um, have you uh, had any misdealings with uh, the UK military up there? Because I've had a stack of misdealings with the UK military whilst adventuring in that area. Oh, no. No, I haven't, actually. I mean, it is perhaps my favorite part of the uk so i've spent as much time up there as i can um yeah. but no and we've climbed on cape roth but um i think you know which is obviously a big military training area but and no when we were there they weren't firing um and we climbed on the cliffs of, of clomore you know, the, the north facing cliffs on um, on cape roth mm. and no no we never had any problems so no, no, you've beaten me there. No, <laughs> it must, it must just be me. Um, I, I have to admit to holding up a live firing. Um, uh, what do they call them? Exercise um, with um, uh, the because it's the biggest Europeans biggest Europe's biggest uh, fighter plane live firing place off Cape Wrath there, and uh, we screwed up the tides kayaking round there, and it took three hours longer than we were expecting. Actually, we had the, well, the weather was quite badly against us as well. That was a big factor in it, and uh, we held it up there. But um, Apple Cross is one place because that's a big um, 
submarine live firing uh, uh, place. And um, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd had my uh, Admiralty chart washed off my sea kayak as I was circumnavigating Scotland um, in a kayak. And so I'd, I just in uh, Malague had managed to go and buy the Ordnance Survey maps and thinking, well, I know what the tides are doing. And they didn't have any charts. And, you know, you can float a kayak in six or eight inches of water. So I don't really need the charts. A map will be good enough. And um, yes, uh, I ended up pulling up to the beach in Apple Cross and starting putting up my tent as a four guys in camouflage with um, SA-80s arrived to ask me what I was doing and pointing out that uh, submarines like to fire there on a regular basis and had been that morning. Um, it was just quite quite an interesting day out, shall we say. It's funny you mentioned that, because as much as I've never had any problems like that, I do remember taking De Flower along, De Flower, De Flower along under the Clomore Cliffs at Cape Roth. Mm. And there's an island you probably know it from your kayaking just offshore there, which they obviously use as target practice. Yep. And it was it was a really misty day, and we weren't sure what the, when the firing times were, and you know, you could hardly see any distance at all. And we came across this island, and you could see that it was just completely obliterated. And I can remember thinking, well, I hope they're not firing today, <laughs> but um. Uh, well presumably they weren't but we never had any trouble but I do remember that particular day thinking oh god it's very misty they won't be able to see us and oh dear <laughs> yeah it's uh, yeah it, it can all get a bit uh, a bit sporty mm-hmm. around there on occasions when they start firing stuff I actually got a uh, stormbound in Sandwood Bay that's just uh, south uh, southwest of Cape Wrath you probably know yes, yeah. And, yeah of uh, course there's there's a cave there that we ended up in and the cave had some bottles of vodka and some um, dead pigeons hanging from the side of it. And it was the, one of the eeriest two days of my <laughs> life about, you know, you really are in the pretty close to the back of beyond when you end up there, as far as the UK is concerned anyway. And uh, mm. why there's dead pigeons hanging from there and why there's vodka in that cave was, I was just waiting for some strange dude to come and tell us it was his house or something. <laughs> uh, but these are good things aren't they you, you, you don't come across things like that um say i don't know on the streets of london no. you've, you've got to seek them out in more obscure and unusual places that's it's it's so 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 true and that's i think for me in terms of the exploration and adventuring part like that you know, just just climbing or just kayaking or just sailing or just whatever it is that you do is I almost feel is often like a a black and white image. And it's that um, the local people, the culture, the vodka and pigeons in a cave in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> that's like it turns it into a color image then, doesn't it? It actually it almost gives you the stories to tell afterwards. Oh, complete, completely. I think it's for me, it's the the, the objective, which is normally a climbing objective, that takes me to the particular place, but then the experience is is the whole the whole caboodle, everything that happens while you're actually there, which is so often things that you can couldn't possibly have anticipated, like meeting hanging pigeons and vodka in caves. <laughs> it's the bizarrest of experience. Hmm? I tell you that for oh yeah, anyway. But if, it, if it hadn't been the kayaking that had taken you there, you'd never have had that had that memorable experience. Exactly. We we actually on that same trip a few days beforehand, we had a it was horrendous weather on the west coast, and we ended up on a beach. And this old couple um, were walking along the beach, and they said, "Oh, we've got our caravan in a farmer's field a few miles away. Come and join us and get warm." And we were frozen, if I'm to be honest. <laughs> And um, the, this this lovely old lady said, oh, would you like a little whiskey? And I thought, oh, that would be so <laughs> nice. And, and she proceeded to, there was three of us, to pour each of us, much to her husband's dismay, about half a pint of whiskey each and say, there you go, that'll warm you up. And I was like, oh, my goodness me, I'm going to have to go kayaking again today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Out of, as we come towards the end of our time together, out of um, all the places and things that you've done, where would you like most to go back to? Oh, 
I think the answer to that would be East Tibet. Um, I think I mentioned earlier mm. that I last went there in 2007 and I managed to get there in 2005 as well. And almost every year since then, I've applied for permits. Let's just get rid of this. No worries. Uh, I've applied for permits to go back to, to East Tibet. And uh, the Chinese authorities are just not having it. So, so I've still not been back. But, I mean, there are, I believe, more spectacular unclimbed 6,000 metre peaks in East Tibet than anywhere else in the rest of the world. And culturally, it um, has been, and I hope it still is, such an interesting place to go. Um, mm. With very much a, um, a devout but varied Buddhist um, area um, with very spectacular mountains. And I can remember the people that we met when we were there, um, they had had absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with Western mountaineers before. And it was a, a quite, it was a very, very special experience going there. And there's a, some mountains there that um, I would love to go and attempt if the Chinese would allow me to. Um, but I was hoping to go in April, you know, in, in three months' time. Mm. But um, I think COVID has put um, put the, the final shutters on that. So um, that would be the area that I would most like to go back to if, um, if I can ever get a permit to do so. So you're just going to keep applying for permits year in, year out until you, until you get one? Uh, well, until I get one or I decide that I'm too old to go, really. <laughs> I don't know when that might be. <laughs> I suppose it will happen one day. <laughs> It'll happen one day. Uh, uh, my, my father's 73 and uh, he, he just says that the adventuring's changed. That's, that's, but, but he still goes adventuring. That's, that's his... Um, so as, a, as opposed to pushing things or going higher or doing new things, he goes and uh, does, does things that are still manageable and uh, has a great time for weeks and weeks and weeks every year doing it. So I just think the adventuring changes. Um, I think so. I think that's, that's, the, that's the way forward, I'm sure. <laughs> there was a, Keep at it. There, there's a very old English gentleman, a guy called Donald Bean, who's sadly not with us anymore, who, who was a whitewater kayaker. Uh, and this guy had kayaked he had a full-time job as an accountant, but had kayaked all over the world. Um, and his, his, he would always um, got dressed for supper, um, even on an expedition in a tweed suit every single time. And um, I think his last trip was kayaking down the Sun Cozy in Nepal when he was 88. So uh, I, I guess there's plenty more time. Uh, there's always somebody who's older than you setting an example <laughs> That's it. i mean you know my climbing partner this year is, is victor saunders who's 71 who's still going incredibly strong yeah brilliant that's it yeah. that's it in fact i was i was talking to a climber um and i can't you will probably recognize his name um i interviewed him the other day um graham zimmerman um oh, yes yeah and he's he's just done a peak last year four of them did the peak and there was two guys him and another guy his age and then two guys in their mid 60s and uh he said they might not have been as physically strong or or fast as graham and his younger pa climbing partner were but that experience and knowledge by far outweighed the the not quite being as strong as a 30 year old so um i reckon experience goes a huge distance yes yeah no i know that well steve svensson and mark ritchie yes yeah no it's an that was a brilliant climb they did, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, uh, and Graham, watch this space. Graham's off for a, um, he can't tell you what it is. Well, I can't tell you what it, I know what it is. <laughs> but uh, he's he's off to go and do some something very, very cool in, in April this year. So uh, watch this space, but it's going to go as a top tip. It's going to go higher than you, but higher than you particularly would want to. So you can start. Hey, well, he's welcome to it then. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so uh, sorry, no, so Graham, you're Mick, aren't you? So, Mick, last last question: um, what's what's next in your going up things future? 
Oh, well, I'm, um, I'm planning to be out in the Alps in the summer. So I think there's some, I, I'm really enjoying um, having a bit more time now, now I've retired from the tax office, spending time um, on those sort of Alpine objectives in Europe that I never got round to doing. So last year, I traversed a peak called the Weisshorn um, yeah. at Zermatt, which is something that I'd wanted to do for many, many years, ever since I first saw it with my father. So in the summer, I'll be very much looking forward to, to continuing like that, assuming that COVID restrictions allow me to get out to the Alps. And then um, in, in post-monsoon, September, October, then I'm hoping that I'll be out in the, in the Himalaya again. There's an unclimbed peak that uh, I won't, won't tell you too much about, <laughs> which we'll be uh, out there doing our very best at. Awesome. So carrying on much as before, really. You just got more time for the planning now. Well, that's right. That's right. I shouldn't complain. <laughs> that's it. That's it. The, the the life of having worked for a life and now having some freedom to go and think more about this stuff and, and plan for it. Um, yeah, the trouble is I'm just getting older as well, but I can't do much about that. <laughs> no, it'll be fine. You've got you've got loads of beans left inside you to do lots more cool stuff. <laughs> So um, last, last question. Um, there's lots of uh, people who listen to this who would like to be the next Mick Fowler. They'd like to go and climb things that other people haven't done or just go to places they haven't been. What advice do you have as we come to the end of this time together for those up and coming climbers who, who want to go and follow your path? <sighs> I think research hard, choose your objective, and go for it. Don't ask too many questions. Just decide what you're going to do and go for it. But be safe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, priority number one, come back home. <laughs> That's important. Yep, yep. I do think there's, you know, there's an, an immense amount of prevarication that goes on sometimes about um, where to go, the best things to do, and people try and find out so much information before they go. And... Um, but um, I think perhaps my advice would be, as I said there, in just a few words, once yeah, ask a few questions, do, do a bit of research, but then just go, get out there. Don't think up reasons why you shouldn't go, just go. And yeah, I'm sure that 99 times out of 100, you won't regret it. You'll have a great experience. Awesome. I always tell people, go book the flights and work, about every, work, out, work out everything else out afterwards. Um, yeah. Then, then, then you've got a fixed date where you have to have all your shit together. <laughs> True. <laughs> cool. Well, Mick, I, I want to thank you for your time today, but um, I, I also want to thank you for offering the outdoor world so much inspiration of going to new places, doing going uh, doing new things, and, and still um, a lot of people out there in the outdoors says, oh, all the best things have been done. And, and you're somebody out there who's proving that actually there's still best and amazing new things to be done if you're prepared to go and put the work in. And uh, I think the world needs more Mick Fowlers to go and show us that and inspire us to go and get off our computers and go and have some cool adventures. So thank you so much for everything that you do. <laughs> Right. Thanks ever so much for having me. <laughs> no worries. Um, Mick, if people want to follow you um, uh, in your trips, do you have any social media stuff or websites or where's the best way to see the latest Mick Fowler adventure? It would be, be through the Berghouse website. Um, I do various blogs for Berghouse. Um, I, I don't have a website myself. So that, that would be the only way really. Oh, and through Facebook, I do have a, a Burkhouse, a Mick Fowler Burkhouse Facebook page, which I post on occasionally. Awesome! I, I love the fact that you're. Um, I love the fact you're breaking the, breaking the what people think should happen for people going in the outdoors and doing cool stuff, where everybody thinks you've got to have Instagram, three websites, and uh, everything else. Um, I love the fact you're just getting out there and worrying about the rest afterwards. That's incredible. No, that would. That would spoil it for me to have to give instant updates on what you're doing. And um, I'm not completely sure. In fact, I'm quite sure that that's not what people really want anyway. I mean, why do you need to know about it as it's happening um, as opposed to learn about it sometime later? 
Yep. I don't, I don't see the urgency. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree. I'm terrible at social media. Um, I have to be honest with you. If it wasn't something I have to do for work, uh, I think I'd probably just walk away from it and go uh, wander around the outdoors doing stuff the whole time. Anyway, Mick, thank you for your time. Um, and folks, if you want to check out Mick, go and check out the Berghaus website, link below. And um, we'll also put a link below for um, uh, Mick's Facebook page as well. So you can go and see him in the flesh and see all the cool stuff and cool places he gets up to. Thank you so much, Mick. Okay, and thank you. <laughs>